see your finger. Okay. All right. Well, let's see if it's working. Um, just came in. Hang on. Let me look over here. If, if you guys are seeing us, happy Wine Wednesday. I'm just making sure we're actually working here. Sorry. Uh, connecting. It says connecting, connecting. Oh, no. Don't do the sending data thing. Okay, we're online. All right. Okay, then we're going to get started again. Happy Wine Wednesday, everyone. Apologies for starting late. I've already explained to the people in the room having some leg swelling trouble and I was soaking in some Epson and lost track of time. So my apologies, but I got wine in hand and I'm here with all of you to talk seahorses and tonight's topic's maintenance. Um, and Ray was getting ready to tell us about maintenance. And of course, we'll take any comments from the comment sections on Facebook or YouTube. And everybody's gonna get a chance to talk, but starting off, um, Cheryl wanted to discuss an important topic that is not related to maintenance technically. Um, so Cheryl, you take the wheel and go ahead and spin. Okay. A friend of mine, Lisa Liu, who is with Seahorse Solutions Facebook page, uh, had a hitchhiker raspberry anemone that showed up in her seahorse tank. She didn't realize it was there. Uh, one pair of her seahorses were dancing got stung and she it, it turned into a major disaster because they had open lesions they had a tissue necrosis she treated them with uh, Puran 2 and triple sulfa and both of them because it functions as a neurotoxin and a cardiotoxin neither of them ever regained full function she finally had to euthanize the male and she sent me the female and her other two seahorses and I lost her female yesterday morning. Again, she never regained full motor capacity. So just be very, very careful with hitchhikers. Uh, it obviously broke her heart. And it's one of those things to be aware of because there is really no known antidote. And depending on the type of anemone, some of them can prove lethal even to, to humans at times. Absolutely. And what were you saying? Anyway, just an FYI. Yeah, and what were you saying about you learned that anemones get put off different toxins? What was that? Well, they both they can produce a neurotoxin, which basically uh, binds with neurons and reduces the ability of the organism that's been basically stung. It reduces their they lose motor control. It also impacts depending on the type. It also impacts the cardio functions so it attacks the heart and the nervous system jeez and there is no cure. that's just terrible guys if you hear a rushing water in the background i just realized i forgot to turn my tank down so i I'll, well as soon as we get to talking it'll get volume should get better in a moment sorry and that's terrible and i i, I remember I a yes sir cheryl what's the difference between my strawberry anemone and the raspberry anemone you're talking about. I maybe I, I don't I don't remember if it was a strawberry or raspberry. It was pink. Yeah, mine are yeah. sort uh, yeah, a pinkish orange. Mine are, but uh, like my tank has been overrun with them for a couple of years, and I've never had any trouble with them. It was in a seahorse tank. Yeah. Well, what happened is when she when they initially got stung. They were dancing and they both got stung at the same time and in the same location uh, just below right right at the base of the tail and it's the only thing she could find in her tank that could have done that kind of damage and so uh what, which species do you have in your tank barbary no but what species of seahorses yeah barbary oh barbary okay yeah. i'm going to tell you a little I've got, uh, you know, but they're in a separate tank. Okay. Because like my combs, my hippocampus combs will not even go near like Kenya tree. They will not touch corals, but they're known to inhabit areas where they're considered a coral reef dwelling species. My erectus, which were Lisa's seahorses were, they have no common sense. They will hitch to anything. And I even got one of my seahorses stung once by what was supposed to have been a zoe. And I thought I was going to lose it because they will, they, they'll hitch to them, they'll grab them. 
and it may be a species difference. Well, like, with mine, they don't hitch to uh, the uh, coral. Uh, I have leather coral. They never hitched on that. And uh, I'm trying to think the name of this one is left. With my MCI, I, I can't get words out. Um, yeah. Kenya. Well, barb and combs are Kenya. kind of from the and same they general area. Hitch, they hitch all the time on the macro, and the macro's got these things growing in them. Yeah. It may be a difference in the actual behavior of the different species involved because I've never said erectus are just they'll hitch to pallies, they'll hitch to anything, they don't care. Yeah. Whereas, like combs, they're only hit, they, they will not go near the corals. That's so interesting. I, I didn't, I mean, I know there's definite differences between the species, I didn't realize that they're hitching differences, you know, they had hitching differences. But I'll tell you, uh, just quick before we are getting to maintenance, guys, I promise. Um, but with Aptasia, I don't care what kind it is, the glass types or, you know, Aptasia or anemones, I don't care what species or what kind, they're all bad in my book. And I had some of the regular brown Aptasia and also the glass Monjo, Mojo, whatever they're called, anemones, um, that came, I don't it must have come on macros that I didn't quarantine good enough um, in, in my big 65 gallon tank. And I watched, I like have video of my female, my big female that always had the beautiful babies. She's still alive, but uh, not as active. She's kind of old. Anyways, to the point, sorry, um, is that she would try to, she would go after food, the Aptasia or anemone, well, probably Aptasia more, more than the anemones, but it would be, you know, the, it would be trying to get the food and she'd go after the food. And I have video of my female seahorse trying to grab a piece of food and that's stinker stinging her right in the face and she jumped back like she couldn't believe it so i i ended up having to clear my whole tank do you guys we are getting maintenance but do you guys what do you guys do when you find you have anemones or aptasia what's your typical solution clorox bleach. <laughs> wait who said who said clorox bleach <laughs> cheryl uh, everything that goes into my tanks it, rock, anything else, is bleached, rinsed, and set out in the sun to dry before it ever goes in the tank. Even my macro, when I bring in macro, it goes through a coral dip, it goes through a freshwater dip, and then it gets to send it, spend six months in a holding tank with me looking for something to pop up on them that I don't want in there. Because there's so many hitchhikers that can come on and come in on so much of this stuff. Yeah. And they, they can prove lethal to seahorses. Sure. No, I mean, and that's, and just, just for the record, anybody watching, if you do bleach your rock or, uh, you know, get man-made rock like I have, um, then she's also, she forgot, didn't forget, but she assumes most people know after you bleach it, rinse it, dry it, you know, let it sit out to dry, you have to recycle it too. You can't just throw it in the well, tank. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Well, some, you know, somebody really new might not know that. So, you know, you say something about bleach. We had a, you know, a presidential thing where he got accused of telling people to inject bleach. So let's not inject bleach into tanks, guys. I also add a dechlorinator. When yes. I use bleach, I add a dechlorinator to it. Uh, I rinse, I add fresh water again, then I add a dechlorinator, mm -hmm. then I rinse again, and then I pull them out to dry. Yes, and fi final comment mm -hmm. about Aptasia and, and these, these types of things is, yeah. in my case, um, I ended up having, I ended up pulling half the rock to keep the tank going, and I kept the sump going and stuff, and kind of used plast a plastic, I um, can't think of what it's called, it looks like tic-tac-toe board, you know what I'm talking about? What are the plastic things? I forget which group it's in. Somebody just recently had a seahorse. She realized she had bristle worms. It tried to snick a bristle worm, and she found the seahorse with the bristle worm in its snout. Oh, man. And, and oh, yeah, and I mean, that, it's got to have spicules inside the snout. I've seen that happen before to other, with other people. And there's not a whole lot you can do. Prevention is much better than trying to correct the problem after the fact. Couldn't agree more. Just to end what I was saying, I sectioned off the tank, pulled the rock. The seahorses were in a place with no rock. I put in fake stuff, and I used uh, fenbendazole uh, type treatment 
that I can tell you about later if you want to know. But it, it wasn't perfect and it took a long time and it was a pain in the boutois. So if you've done something to rid your tank of Baptasia, uh, speak up. The other thing that I've used successfully are peppermint shrimp, but you have to get the right species. And yeah, as for, or as for uh, bristle worms, I have heard you know people recommend the traps. I've never encountered that in a seahorse tank because I don't do sand. And uh, I know they can be in rocks, but I just, I haven't ever had that problem. So, um, yeah, I don't know. But I, I do, uh, anybody can talk more about this if you'd like, but I did want, Ray, were you starting to tell us about your current uh, maintenance or how you take care of your seahorse tanks? I think most people know that uh, I'm very basic, uh, no substrate at all, very simple setup and uh, do my water changes. I, I prefer to do them every 10 days but sometimes it goes to 12 days. Um, and other than that, it's simple. It's, it's a lot easier for me to do that than uh, go buy a bunch of sophisticated equipment that uh, means I have to spend money that I don't want to spend on something. Mm -hmm. And uh, my salt water is fairly cheap anyway because I buy up uh, 12 cases at a time and uh, then I mix it uh, half and half with my homemade mix. Right, and when you when you do your water changes every 10 days, you I think I remember you do like 90%, right? Yeah, sometimes 95. 95, so you do... So you, do you do big water changes every 10 days? Yeah, I'll do uh, basically 90% if I do it in 10 days, and if I go 12 days, I'll do 95. And really quick question uh, that I hear a lot when we're talking about someone who does big water changes versus fewer, smaller water changes. Um, do you bother worrying about matching temperature and, you know, salinity and pH and all that stuff or no? I don't uh, bother with the pH uh, because there isn't that much difference. Uh, but I match temperature and I match uh, specific gravity. Yeah, gotcha. How, do you top off every day or how often do you top off? Yeah, I top off every day. Yeah, that's what I do too. And with top off, we're talking, uh, you know, do you guys use RODI water? Yes. Yes. The rest of you can pipe in anytime. <laughs> um, I'm, I'll call on you too to get your, get your specific maintenance set up because everybody does things differently. And, you know, what works for one works for them, you know? So... Um, I probably have forgotten find what, what, Ray? That's the main thing. Just find what works for you. Yep. If it's something that, uh, you don't mind doing, then you're less likely to let it go. Sure. But if you're doing something because someone else has told you that's the best way to do it and it's irritating you doing it, you're going to let it, uh, lapse at times and uh, your feet horses will end up being in, in trouble. Sure. Just because it's right for someone, it doesn't mean it's right for everyone. Gotcha. So, and so you, I'm, I'm sure too, you run into this, depending on if you have a tank with a lot of fry in it or like a grow out tank where you've got 60 or 70 youngsters in there. Uh, I, I obviously have to do water changes a lot. Well, on the nurseries, they get changed clean twice a day. Yeah, I, what, I, what? sorry, Cheryl, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What I was thinking is we'll go through and everybody can tell, you know, with their, their basic maintenance tank uh, schedule on a regular tank. And then I definitely want to dive into fry. I mean, feel free to can finish your sentence. I wasn't trying to at all cut you off. I just thought, you know, because people are very, many people are caring for fry these days, many of our room members even. Um, so we definitely want to talk about that. But just for the newcomer, what, what's your basic setup for a regular seahorse tank with adults? Correct? A regular seahorse, like if I've got, you know, a half a dozen and a 58 gallon with a 29 gallon sump, I mean, it can go seven days without a water change. However, since so, most of my stuff is bare bottom, I, I do smaller water changes at least every other day just to keep them looking clean and to keep the need to debris from collecting. But it's not necessary, quite frankly, to do it that often. It's just me being myself. I don't like it when they start looking messy. Right. You can get away with that. I figure about once every seven to 10 days. Yeah. And how big of a water change do you do when you do them? Uh, it, it depends on the system. 
Uh, usually, so, uh, I like to do a 15 to 20 percent water change, mm -hmm. but I also have a, uh, in my systems. I have a, a very large amount of rubble rock in the stumps I built were specifically so I could have a lot of rubble rock in there. And I'm also run uh, K1 media reactors, which makes a big difference on them also. So you've got a whole bunch of biological material, and I know you have yeah. skimmers on every tank too, right? Well, the skimmers I'm running uh, on a 60 gallon system. Mm -hmm. I'm running skimmers for 180 gallons, rated for 180 gallons. Right. So over, you know, <laughs> a double the the punch kind of skimmer. Gotcha. And you use the socks, and so you have you use the the regular what works equipment. Do you use UV sterilizers at all? And like on my nursery systems, right. I run two K1 media reactors. Gotcha. Make sure I don't get any spikes. So you really hit in on the biological. Gotcha. Um, and uh, do, I don't, I don't know, think I said it right or whatever. But do you run UV sterilizers on the regular seahorse tanks, or any, for that matter? Um, I'm gonna repeat the question. Do you use UV sterilizers on any yes. of the? Okay, okay. I just wondered. So you kind of go uh, with the equipment and smaller water changes. Well, I I run the K1 medias. I run the UVs. I run oversized skimmers. Uh, obviously, filter socks. I have like twenty filter socks, uh, and I have a lot of bio media in there. I also run Purigen and activated car or carbon on my in my tanks. Nice. We had a question in the group uh, just this past week um, asking if carbon was okay to run in a seahorse tank. So you're proof that apparently it is. <laughs> well, the, the carbon will be The carbon will what, Cheryl? What'd you say, Cheryl? The carbon will what? The carbon helps to detoxify. Yeah. Um, and it helps, it helps with this dissolved organics. It just, I look at all these pieces, it's just one more piece of the puzzle to keep the tanks cleaner. Absolutely. Did you say something, Ray? I was just gonna say uh, for the carbon there, dissolved organics. Um, I've got one, the barb tank doesn't have a skimmer on it, the abs tank does. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the barb tank, if, uh, if I figure I've, uh, got any problem at all that way, then I'll throw carbon on it. I have carbon, uh, I've got a reactor, I can throw uh, the stuff in the reactor or I can put it in a bag. Um, I prefer the reactor, but the thing is, um, I like to take it out and rinse it uh, occasionally because uh, it's like a mechanical filter. I believe mechanical filtration should be cleaned every three days. Uh, I, for myself, I want to do it every third day, my mechanical filter and my filter stock, but sometimes it gets four days, but, uh, I don't want to leave it any longer because the trap, the crap that it, uh, uh, traps is going to, uh, break down and, uh, put more, uh, nutrient and, uh, dissolved organics into the water. So doing it ahead of time, uh, you know, clean it out before it gets too much breakdown. But uh, if I've let it go too long, then running carbon will help with the dissolved organics that I've ended up putting in there. Yeah, you have to definitely keep up on changing out the carbon on a regular basis. Yeah. And it, it, also, it also traps the uh, crap in it too, unless you're gonna put a filter on it before, um, before the carbon. Isn't carbon one of the products that can that has been accused of leaching back out if it's left too long, or am I thinking of something else? Well, I've heard uh, that some forms do, and I'm not sure now with my MCI. I can't remember specifically the types or the forms that uh, leach back out, but uh, I know for quite a while there uh, in the reef industry, um, people were uh, companies were specify or there was stating right on their pack on their uh, packaging that uh, this carbon will not leak back gotcha um, yeah, if, you're, if you're not going to change it regularly and same with purigen 
uh, don't use it because it's going to cause the problems for you. It, it's great, but you've got to change it out on a regular basis. Absolutely. You know, Purigen is one I, I, that I really like, and I use it in fresh water too. Um, but Purigen is one I really like that I don't hear a lot about in, uh, in, in the, like, the reef um, folks. And it does seem to be more of a seahorse people. In fact, British seahorse people use it a lot, I've noticed. <laughs> but anyways, really quick, I wanted to read comments. Um, Mermaid's Reef um, actually mentioned when we were back on Aptasia, and I missed his comment, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, her comment. His comment. I'm, I'm brain, brain going. Anyways, Mermaid's Reef says that they use calc paste and peroxide on Aptasia. Um, before I start telling you guys what Holly's talking about, um, does anybody have anything that, and I, I'm going to move right on to you, Marina. Sorry, I just saw the comments. But does anybody have anything that they just think should not be used, like calc? Um, I know a lot of people who do use it, but if you don't know what you're doing, I believe that calc's the one that can kind of mess up your water um, parameters, if I'm not mistaken. So you have to kind of... I found biopellet reactors were a waste of money. Biopellet <laughs> reactors are a waste of money? Really? <laughs> they didn't do anything. Well, see, that's another <laughs> one. Yeah, that's another one. You know, when you get into that stuff, you have to really know what you're doing because that's... If you're not, especially if you're not testing pH and stuff, that can really mess things up if you don't have a clear and concise idea of what you're about, you know? Well, so. and a friend of mine who's a hardcore reefer says bio pellet reactors will kill his zoanthids. And I mean, he's the kind of guy that uh, sells them mm. and grows out zoos. He goes, they'll kill the zoos. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, wow. Um, have you? That was interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I've never tried. I got really close to trying a biopellet reactor because I know people who swear by them. I, I it was on my reef, not my seahorse tank, because it's. I just didn't. You know, I don't think keeping things. I don't know. I just didn't. I was going to do it on the reef. That's the bottom line. But it's interesting. I can't wait to see if some of the other ladies have used them and and what they think about them. But um, Ray, do you have any thoughts on calc or anything or anything that shouldn't be used in a seahorse tank? Uh, well, I've never used calc in a seahorse tank because I've had no need for it. But uh, um, right, and he was I was running tank for so many years. People were killing aptasia then with uh, calc paste. Right. Uh, for me, I had lots of calc here because I used to buy it in 40, uh, 40 pound bags. But uh, uh, I used uh, hydrochloric acid on them. Mm -hmm. I used to take uh, fill up my hypodermic needle and as a syringe, and uh, then you you quickly zap right into the hole that they are at because uh, they're going to withdraw immediately. So you've got to get them right in the hole and you squirt a little bit, but you got to make sure that there's nothing above it so that when the bubbles come out, you carry some of the acid upwards so it's not affecting anything. And you yeah. got to know how to handle that. So it's not for it's not for people that uh, don't know how to to handle it. Right, and the calc, um, the calc also is that. Sorry, go ahead, Ray. I have a question. Uh, has anybody yeah. ever used Chemipure Elite or GFO on a seahorse tank? Any of you guys? Hmm. Any of the ladies who yeah, haven't I've used uh, GFO? I'm sorry, Ray. I've used the GFO. You do okay. And, but uh, because at one no, point, I don't, but I, I well, at one point they were saying not to use GFO or Chemipure Elite because it basically it was a metallic compound which mm. caused problems with seahorse gills. And I'm going back 15 years on this, but I'm seeing a lot of people starting to use these products on seahorse tanks. That's why I was wondering. Well, really quick, I want to get to you, all your maintenance schedules, ladies, but. Yeah, I'm curious if uh, if Mar Marina or who else do we have? I have to look. Sorry, I'm cheating. Or Nicole or Holly. I know you can't talk, but <laughs> you can say in the comments. I'm going to explain your situation in a second. But have you guys used GFO or Chemi Pure Elite on seahorse tanks? Either of you? <laughs> no. Yeah. I haven't either, so I can't really give much comment to that. But it, you know, if it's working for you, Mermaid's Reef, you know how it is. I did use 
you know, all of the products we're talking about on the reef. I just guess I never found the reasoning for a seahorse tank, you know. Um, and before the ladies who are here tell us their maintenance schedule, um, Holly had an issue with her microphone tonight. So she is here and present and participating, but she's doing it in the comments on YouTube. So I'm going to read off what she has said so far. Um, she has, in case anybody has questions or comments for her, she has a 55-gallon display tank, a 10-gallon sump, but she's upgrading to a 30-gallon sump, and a 240-gallon skimmer is now ready to go. She's been doing weekly water changes about a third of the tank. Um, and then she said she used distilled water to top off. Someday she'll get a re reverse osmosis unit. And I, I do hope we do a little discussion on why that's important and if it's really needed and where it's needed. Um, and Mermaid's Reef mentioned distilled water can have copper in it. So if you plan on adding any corals, be careful. And Holly said no corals because she's doing strictly seahorses. I did not know that distilled water could have copper in it. That's interesting. I'll tell you, I used distilled water for a long time before I got an R RODI unit. Um, so I, I had no idea. Interesting. Um, and someone else has joined. Hello. Um, but that's Holly's deal. So if you have questions for her or comments, feel free. And she's going to keep participating in the comments. And she'll be lively, more lively next week. <laughs> but uh, Nicole, do you want to share your, your maintenance uh, schedule? Like when you do water changes? Or you just, you can, you can say no. <laughs> I do every two weeks. I do a twenty percent gotcha. water change. And are you are you every two weeks twenty percent? And are you using a lot of equipment to make yourself have to do less? Oh, I will just you know the usual. I have oh. you know my my skimmer. No, not not really. But I do twenty percent. Seems to be okay so far. Knock on wood. Yeah, no. Hey, if you don't see problems, then what you're doing is right. Like we discussed last week, absolutely. <laughs> I agree. My schedule is more similar to yours than theirs. So <laughs> don't, don't worry. Um, and yeah, I just, is there anything that you use that's not, you know, the, on the typical or anything that you can think of that just absolutely you would never use on a seahorse tank? No, nothing that I can think of. I did use GFO for a short period of time, um, probably a couple of months after my, you know, tank, after I initially added the seahorses, which was probably four or five months in to, you know, the entire cycle. But um, I did that because I was having a lot of higher nutrients. And then I think it actually did more harm than good. I feel like it bottomed everything out. Like my nitrates are zero, which phosphate, great. But nitrates, I, you know, then I found out that can cause, cause algae problems if they are zero. Yeah. So I ended up pulling that. Yeah, that's a, no, you made an excellent point that sometimes some of this media and equipment that we use can bring things down too low, too clean, and that can cause real problems too. Do you keep uh, coral in, or macros in your seahorse tanks or are you um, more? Uh, I do. I have a, I have a few corals. I have, um, let me see, what do I have? I have a Gorgonian. I have some um, green star polyps and then I have... Uh, God, Napsia, which I bought from oh, yeah. Alyssa recently. Yep. And then I have a um, feather duster. Awesome. And even though you're not talking about any like real soakers like the SPS, you know, that really need pristine water or whatever, of course we want to control nutrients. And I totally understood your point about something bottoming things out. Completely get it. Um, so I'm curious, how often do you test now that you've gotten everything? where you want it, do you still test or did you own, you know, do you still test? Yeah, you, yeah, usually every week or two, unless I see something wrong or I feel like maybe out of paranoia, something might be wrong, then I test, but every week or two, depending. And what all do you test for? I, well, I always test for nitrates. I test for phosphates. I test my pH. That's really the extent of it. I haven't really gotten too far into, you know, I know a lot of people will test for Calcium and magnesium, I really don't worry myself too much with that, where it's, you know, mostly a seahorse tank, and I only have a couple of corals that seem to be doing just fine. No, absolutely. In fact, just jumping really quick back to Ray, do you ever test? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know that one. No. Right. So, Specific gravity and uh, keep an eye on temperature. Um, 
cool. That's that's it. Like I go by what I see in the tanks. Yeah. Uh, like even my reef tanks, and I, I wasn't one of these people that was testing all the time. Um, I just didn't see a need for it. To, but part of it was I'd been doing it for so many years. I got used to seeing what it should look like, and if something started changing, then I knew something was wrong. And uh, almost always, it was the case of uh, if I saw something wrong and think back, oh, I haven't been keeping up on my uh, maintenance schedule. Yep, gotcha. So, and it's the same with the seahorses. Uh, I go by what I see. Well, and that's and that's based on experience. So that's why I, I'm so glad, Nicole, that you did share you know, what you, what you look out for and et cetera, because for anyone that doesn't have 105 years experience like Ray, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no. I, I agree with Ray. I do test my top off water and my salt mix every day before I use it. And that's just a safety precaution. It's probably not necessary, but when you you can look at a tank and look at the seahorses and tell if they're in distress. They're, you watch their respiratory rate, the way they're swimming. They'll tell you if there's something to miss in the tank. So I don't really worry too much about topping off the tanks. I just take care of my, my freshly made salt mix and my top off water. So you don't ever test the, the actual tanks? Cheryl? Yes. You just test the, the, the new water? Yes. Wow. See, I mean, and you know, it, it, it works for them, obviously, guys, but I'm still going to pipe up and say anybody newer, <laughs> go ahead and test. There's nothing wrong with testing. Uh, these guys just really know what they, they've done this for a long time and they know what they're, you know, I still test. I'll, I'll tell you that. Not as often as I used to, but especially if I see something wrong, I test. Or, you know, even if just it's been a while, I'll just test. And I keep those, I don't even know if they work, but I keep those little, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the group. CCAM, I think it is, um, ammonia. <laughs> the things you stick in your tank and it turns a different color green. They probably don't even work, but they make me feel better, you know? So nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I do want to really quick before we... Uh, just open chit chat about whatever. Marina, I want to hear your schedule and how you, if you do anything differently. Well, I, I do test oh. my uh, specific gravity on oh. a regular basis on each of my tanks. Sure. Just to make sure that I'm topping off the amount I need to maintain a stable specific gravity. That's not, I don't consider that a test. That's just more of a Get out the refractometer. <laughs> right. And ju that's just like temperature. We all, you know, we're not mentioning it, but everybody's making sure they got something testing their temperature constantly because that's one of the bigger things. And I do, I want to, I want to ask Marina uh, really quickly about her schedule, but I do want everybody to kind of talk about what temperature they keep their tank to. You know, we're talking maintenance and such, and we've already said it's important to make sure that new water matches the temperature of the tank. But Marina... Um, what do you, yeah, sorry. You have such a soft voice and we're all so loud. <laughs> you always get overrun. Sorry. How, what's your, how often do you do water changes? What do you worry about? What kind of equipment are you using? I'm going to be quiet so you can talk. Um, so my tank is mainly run on biological filtration. Um, I've got quite a bit of, um, sand and rock in the tank and a lot of extra media in the sump. I also run carbon and I have a skimmer, but I only turn it on when something new goes into the tank. Hmm. Um, the reason for that is it's sort of balanced itself out. Nitrate and phosphate is always pretty close to zero. And so when there's a new addition in the tank and I'm going to be feeding more or something like that, I turn the skimmer on just to help the system keep up with that. So you've gotten it so, so, so stabilized and so under the um, scope of what you can see when something's wrong and you know if you add something, I get what you said, um, but that's really interesting that because do you think that if you turned the skimmer on 24-7 it would do too much good, like bottom out, as we were talking about earlier? Um, yeah, bottoms out pretty quickly if the skimmer's on. Gotcha. Interesting. 
um, and with water changes, I only do them probably every four to six weeks. Nice. Wow. And it would be about 25 to 35%. And that's just because I feel like I should do one. Um, I just think a water change is a really good way to balance everything out, even if it's not necessarily something I know about or something I test for. So it's more of just a preventative thing rather than needing to be done. Um, but I also dose um, beneficial bacteria quite often to the tank. And that's that's a key. That's key. So you're dosing ben beneficial bacteria. You're only doing water changes every four to six weeks. I don't think I've ever heard a seahorse keeper say that. But you know what? If it's working for you, <laughs> you know, I want to hear more. Do you have, um, how big is the tank again? I, I've forgotten. Sorry. Um, it's about 300 liters. Oh, which boy. I think is yeah. about 80 gallons. Okay. 80. Okay. So that's a big. No, I've, I'm probably. I've probably made a mistake there, but I think that's approximately. I hear you. Yeah. And I mean, that's, so that's a bigger tank. We're not talking about a 30 gallon tank, which, you know, would really seriously require more water changes. You're talking about a big system. Um, does it have a sump or. Yeah. And what, what equipment do you use to be able to go four to six weeks without a water change? You already said the skimmer is shut off most of the time. So what do you use? So I've got um, Biomedia, just ceramic. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have mantis blocks. We've got something similar. We've got bricks and, yeah, spheres and all sorts of fun stuff. <laughs> so Yeah, so I've got quite a lot of that in the sun. And I've also got a carbon block. Mm. Um, which apparently for a 300 litre tank is meant to last about two and a half to three months. But um, also that's another thing is I'll add actual good granules of carbon if I add something new. Gotcha. And, and I, I think I was saying, yes, I knew what you were talking about, but I, I think I was joking because I don't. What's a carbon block? What is that? How does that? Um, I will actually try and get a picture of it. Oh, and yeah. Share the screen. Um, give me a sec to get one up. Yeah, absolutely, because I'd, I'd love to see it. But and, and while you're looking, one more question. How long has the tank been going? Um, so the tank's been going for about a year. Nice. And I think that's part of... Um, I've had most of the seahorses longer than a year, but... This is the, um, the new tank's been up for about a year. And I run it, ran it for almost, almost six months before adding the seahorses. Um, but in that time, I was feeding as if the seahorses were there. Absolutely. So it had quite a while to get used to sort of the heavy amount of food before the seahorses went in. I've also got a bit of soft coral, which I think is one of the biggest parts of the filtration, even though it's not really normally considered that. I think that um, that the coral really helps to take up things like nitrate and phosphate. I actually don't disagree with you at all. That's I'm, I'm the macro girl. That's, you know, it's not coral, not the same, but kind of is, you know, in many ways. And, and I'm using it not just to be, to make the tank beautiful but, or pretty in my opinion, but also for those reasons, I'm into scrubbers. I'll talk about me in a minute. We want to talk about you. Um, but okay, we're, let me try to put you up top. Are you showing us a picture? Uh, yes. Okay. I think so. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> It's okay if you can't, but yeah, let me know. There we go. Are you seeing uh, now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so we've got, um, it's a mantis carbon block wow. and it sits in this um, sort of acrylic stand and it's designed for water to be able to flow through it well. And um, how sort of my knowledge of carbon is, is it's meant to be most effective in the first few days. Um, 
So I'm not really sure what makes these last so long, but apparently they do. Gotcha. What well, I mean that yeah, those would work really well. I know. Cheryl and I are like, gimme, what? Are you serious? <laughs> Sorry. But hang on. Let me go back to you. And then this is the sort of media that um I would use also. Okay, so the, the wait, the media was separate, right? That's um folks, Marina is in Australia, right? Yes. Yeah, so she has products we don't have here in the US and um we're liking it. But so the the media does what again? I'm sorry. Those are the Um it's just extra biological filtration. And they're um, like bricks kind of in a plastic tray? Yeah, it's very similar to um sort of in its purpose it would be really similar to marine pure except yep. this is really hard like you can throw it at a brick and it wouldn't break it's really um really strong so it doesn't break down and crumble like marine pure would wow. and there's a lot of different brands of essentially the same thing so there's the mantis blocks there's ams blocks yeah. and maspect box blocks Okay, well, these are a few brands of it anyway, blocks. but they all do the same, the same thing. Gotcha. Okay. Sure. These are called carbon blocks, but are they actually truly carbon or are they ceramic blocks? Because we've got ceramic blocks stateside. The only problem with them is they tend to deteriorate over time. And if you go to move them, they turn into sand. So they're, they, they create some serious problems. Yeah. So that's the main difference between this kind of... Um, media block i'll get up so this one here is the bio media and these are like i said very similar to like a marine pure except they don't break down they don't um deteriorate and turn like crumble over time they're really really strong um i used to run a lot of marine pure and have swapped over to wow. um this sort of a block for that reason and then these are the carbon if I can get it up. Yes. These ones here are the carbon blocks. And this particular um, brand of them, they're actually made out of coconut husk, I believe. Wow. Hey, guys, guess what I want to be looking at here? <laughs> I know. Cheryl's going to investigate. So, yeah. Anything, I, to make, anything to make it simpler and it works. Yeah. I mean, water changes every four to six weeks. I bet if I had close-ups of Ray and Cheryl's faces when she said that, it was probably like jaw drop. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I mean, it, uh, Marina, not man, sorry. But that is so cool. I mean, I'm so glad you shared that with us because, man, yeah. U.S. needs to step up. Jeez. Well, the, the stuff I've got here, as I said, it just, after it's been in the tank for a period of time, if you go to move it, it just disintegrates. And then you've got a big pile of sand in the bottom of your sump. Right. Which is not cool. And Marina, and I'm, it's go ahead. It's quite tricky to clean when it's all... Um, all crumbled with the with the carbon block and I, I understood completely what you were saying about the other um the bio bio media that's like marine pure but it doesn't break down like marine pure so they've done something better or different um but on the actual carbon blocks um that were different you explained um do those like you know when i'm thinking I, i've never seen anything like it so i'm thinking of the carbon packets or a reactor or whatever that's that's just a dang mess and like even when i when i used the carbon filter media packets in my freshwater aquariums or in my reef i would have to rinse them forever because they'd be bleeding black stuff and these blocks just don't do any of that they've figured something out or like are they I lined rinse it, i rinse it in ro water before it goes in just oh, to okay. be safe but um, it doesn't, like, running just normal carbon, I find I've got to run it under the tap for quite a while before all that sort of um, black sort of dis dust sort of stops coming out. But this, it's like a few seconds swoosh in some RO water and pop it in the tank. That is amazing. And I, you know, it, you, my, my criteria, when somebody says they're doing something, I will listen to everybody. And if it's working for them, my thumbs up, but my, my personal criteria for, Ooh, maybe I want to try that is typically like someone's been going at least a year, you know, because anybody can say something's working for two months and I don't, you know, I believe them, 
Uh, but I personally wouldn't try it until they've, you know, had uh, many, almost a year, six months, something of showing that it actually does work. Um, so this is really, really, really cool to learn. Um, I'm going to, I bet you Cheryl will be too researching this. Cause, yeah, uh, I, I'm going to take a look at that because I've got some uh, bulk reef supply. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're super high grade carbon and I put it into a bag I wasn't using my brain and the bag had the holes that were a little too big. Oh. And I have a tank right now that has carbon all over the substrate. I'm going to have to clean out. I actually, I actually tried to reuse Purigen once and tried to use like pantyhose or something because the bag had gotten to the point of no return. And it, for some reason I thought, I don't know. Anyways, I did the same thing with, uh, Purigen. It was it was quite fun. Let me tell you, lots yeah. and lots of fun. Um, but anyhow, Marina, was there um, any? Did I miss any questions with you? Like I can't. I, I'm still like, wow, four to six weeks. That sounds like a reef tank. Or I mean, my reef tank. But reef tank. I honestly never did water changes because I used equipment in you know to and dosing to make it happen. And what's interesting is I heard you mention bio or. Um, Help me out, Marina. What what's it called? Uh, the bacteria. <laughs> yeah, um, dosing sort of beneficial bacteria. Beneficial, that's the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I hadn't heard anybody mention, and something that I also do, probably not as often as you. How how often do you dose it? So I try to dose it. I do sometimes forget, mm -hmm. but I try to dose it every week. Gotcha. Well, and that, that you are like mm -hmm. living proof that. You know, people, this this room has been quite interesting because we've got folks that do huge water changes every week or two. We've got folks that, you know, have a more regular schedule of 20% or so every couple weeks. And then we've got people who are using media and, you know, biological media and beneficial bacteria and going four to six weeks. I just think that's so cool that we're all doing things differently and it's working. But um, do you use UV sterilizers? Because I've always worried about that with, Bacteria and stuff. Kelly, what she's showing us with the, the, the blocks that are going in yeah. are similar to the same kind of pattern that some of the Red Sea tanks are going with mm. their stackable filter systems as part built into the tank rather oh. than using some. Gotcha. And it's kind of interesting because I was looking at those and I know a lot of people do use the Red Seas. Mm. And I'm thinking you could build wow. a rack like that to hold different products in a large sump that would work beautifully. I mean, it'd be easy to build. And and I want you to get on it, Cheryl, because I can't afford <laughs> I can't afford a brand new Red Sea tank with all the stuff kit and caboodle. Hey, which tank you want me to start on? <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Um, but no, I, I, I did want to know, but that's interesting, absolutely. And I'm going to go research that as soon as we get off of here um, because I didn't know that they were doing that. But stackable does make more sense, um, especially because many people don't want to do the sump, even though it's, you know, especially the best in a seahorse tank. Uh, my opinion, guys, many people get away without it. Just my opinion. Well, the thing is, too, the ways those are sitting in trays or in blocks, really it would be so easy to just lift them out of a sump, rinse them, to clean them off, suction your sump, you got everything clean, and it's so much easier than trying to move rubble rock and stuff like that. Absolutely, I, I love the stackable idea. It's really, it's really quite smart. Um, and look, you know, hey, you're te you're schooling us, Marina. <laughs> but yeah, I was curious. One more, more, one more question about the beneficial bacteria type deal. Do you use UV ster uh, sterilizers also, Marina, on your tank or no? So I don't. But it's something that um, I'm looking at doing. Gotcha. Um, I've been watching BRS TV's videos on UV sterilizers and things, and yeah. um, it seems like a really good preventative measure for mm -hmm. diseases and even for algae. Yep. Like pest algae. Um, so that's definitely something I'm looking into. Um, gotcha. Go ahead. Where possible. I like to try and use a sort of, um, I like to try not to use chemicals if I can. So, um, 
I'm also looking at something like an algae scrubber as a preventative sort of a thing. Just things that will... I'm trying to keep the tank in balance as much as possible, if that makes sense. It does, but you're also, what you're saying, I know you're using media and a skimmer when you add new things, but you're, I think, I think what I hear is you want to keep it as natural as possible. I don't know many people who have succeeded long term with a completely natural tank, um, but you're doing your best to keep it as natural as possible. Is that right where you're at? Yeah. Gotcha. And, um if something happens where something needs to be changed, I will change it. Like at the mo at the moment, um, I'm feeding quite heavily, but there's really not that many seahorses and fish in the tank. So if I add a lot more and, you know, four to six weekly water changes aren't enough, then I'll do them more. Right. But, um, sort of just adjust as the... Um, the tank sort of grows but I think a really really big part of it is the coral and the macro algae I, I do not disagree <laughs> Go ahead. I've got a question how many people here or know of people that run wave makers on their seahorse tanks because that makes a big that makes a big difference in terms of your flow rate so I've just added one in. Really? So you went, Marina, I'm, now I'm really curious. So you were able to go like a full year with no, with just the, like the, the, um, I know I always say it backwards. I know the return is not what I think it is, but with just the sump providing flow. Yeah. So I've got a water box tank okay. and how their return, um, the return line works is it splits into two return outlets and so with a quite a strong return pump it makes quite a bit of flow um no you I, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you but i have an sca 90 that's exactly the same way the only reason i ended up adding um the the long wave maker that is round i can't think of the name max guy or whatever it is um the only reason i ended up adding one of those is literally for the bottom and it, it probably wasn't even needed. I always kept it really low. So when you added the, the wave maker, did you, what was your reasoning and where did you add it? So I added it quite high. Okay. And the reason, um, the reason for that was, um, I quarantine, um, anything that's anything that's a fish. So seahorses and fish, um, get quarantined for two to four weeks using the tank transfer method mm -hmm. and then absolutely everything else whether it's macroalgae or a coral or a snail gets quarantined for three months and I was finding because I've got a lot of leather corals um, that they were going from um, sort of a, a decent amount of flow and then moving in the quarantine tank and then moving to the seahorse tank where it just wasn't the same. Gotcha. There just wasn't enough flow. So I added it mostly for the corals and they really liked it. And I was really surprised by how much the seahorses um, enjoyed the extra flow. Absolutely. Like they it and they, they think it's great. So, yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. In my in my first very first tank, which was com it was at first it didn't have a sump at all. It was literally just macros that were really handling the tank. I did have rock in there, but no sand, and um, I did not have a wave maker at first. I was just using like filtration because and when I first started, I thought they can't have high flow. And man, when I added a wave maker, those seahorses were dancing. <laughs> they they were so much more active, you know, so totally with you. They, they will swim into the flow and depending on erectus are notorious for swimming straight into the flow until they can't go anymore and doing somersaults backwards across the tank. Yep. And I've had many seahorses. I, I posted a picture of, uh, in a group once of my seahorse hitched onto um, the, uh, the line 
um, that went to head, that led to the wave maker, and it was literally laying on. Of course, I cover my wave makers and power heads and etc. to be sure that they can't hurt their tails. But it was hitched on the cord that comes in, and then it was laying upon the cover and had its head literally ba 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 in the flow, and it was sleeping that way. And I tell you, everybody jumped me and like, oh, you're terrible, you're killing your, that you're such a cruel person. And I was like, nah, man, if I move that seahorse, that would, he would be so mad. <laughs> I'm telling you, they love yeah, flow. They would sit there and get bat battered back and forth, back and forth, and finally release their hold on the power head or the wave maker get blasted across the tank and, it, and my combs will do it but in a different way uh they're they're much more cautious about the flow than the erectus the erectus are just plain ding dongs sure and i i honestly i think that barbori are too ray would you say that do you, do you see the barbori like playing in the flow and swimming towards it or do they just know it's there you know, I, wave maker I, I mine are all power heads like this, uh, the Barbary tank's got uh, three, three power heads in it uh, at 400 gallons an hour, and uh, a small one that I don't know what the rating is. Plus, it's got uh, two airlines in it as well with large bubbles, uh, and then of course the return flow coming from the sump. Um, so there's a lot of areas where there's flow, and uh, there are some areas. They don't uh, seem to like the high flow in, in uh, certain areas, but other areas, it's like uh, Cheryl mentioned, uh, they swim right into it and then go for a ride, turn around, go right back and yep. do it. <laughs> Absolutely. I've watched that so many times. Sure. Well, I but think that's, that's the biggest experience I've ever had uh, has done that. Gotcha. And hang on, let's let Marina, she's so soft-spoken. <laughs> what were you saying, Marina? Um, I was just going to say, I think that's a really good point as well. Like, um, as much as they really do like the float and they play in it and they think it's great, um, I've also made sure there are areas where they can go and there's not very much flow. So Absolutely. they can sort of chill out and relax when they want to. Yeah, and I'm curious. Um, I do want to. I, I, we're we're already going over time because I we get to talk, and I just love talking to you guys. <laughs> and I got to check comments again. Darn it! Sorry, guys, if I've missed you. Um, but I'm curious because I did want everybody that's currently dealing with fry to kind of explain what they do differently in their fry tanks as far as maintenance, because obviously. You know, four to six weeks on a fry tank, I can't even imagine. <laughs> but maybe maybe Marina will surprise us and tell us that's what she does. But, um, oh my gosh, now I forgot what I was going to say. Dead, gone it. The difference. I cracked a joke short time ago about, I know I'm way behind on my flow with my fry tanks. When the fry are swimming around and hitching to the return. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, no, that that's what yeah. I uh, Thank you, Cheryl. You just reminded me what I was going to ask. Yeah. Does time, it, time, to, time to increase the flow on those pumps. Right. But one of the things that I noticed when I upped the flow to the point where I felt that my adult seahorses really liked it, um, then I noticed they had a hard time with egg exchanges. Probably I just didn't have the flow just right. But do you turn down your flow if you know that your seahorse is either going to, um, a male seahorse is about to give birth? Or they're they're trying and having trouble getting the egg exchange to click. Well, all my pumps are adjustable, right? So and I I adjust the flow based on combination of size of the seahorses, stocking density. I also uh, are you? I don't know if you've seen seen these, Kelly. Uh, Hydor H Y D O R makes a little wave maker that you can hook on to a, other pumps. And it rotates. Oh, yes, I have and, seen them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've used those on several of my tanks because they continually are, because they're rotating, they're continually moving the water around top to bottom, which is what I want. Right. And I have so many old uh, marine land power heads that I'm, I'm good to go. They're like $10. Right, right. I, I, I like the Jabeo. Uh, adjustable pumps too, but there's definitely something to say said for adjustable. Ray, um, I know you you don't have adjustable, right? Because you just do the you make your own kind of. 
Well, you you can physically do it. Like there's levers on these pumps. They're uh, Hagen pumps. Um, they're called 802s when I bought them. Like I bought them back in the mid 90s, mm -hmm. but I'm still using them. I can't see uh, buying something new when the old ones work. Sure. But uh, they don't call them that anymore. Now they call them AquaClear. Gotcha. Uh, but they have they have a lever on the pump instead of having a, a, a an attachment. Yeah, but gotcha. in my case, I don't touch. I don't ever touch uh, those levers at all. I leave everything wide open. But uh, I have the pumps on timers, so different pumps uh, can be on it. Uh, at different times um, and it changes yeah. the flow um, just for that and specifically uh, when I feed there are ones that I physically move the timer to off position so that um, the power head that has a quick filter on it isn't going to suck up the food while uh, sure. uh, they're feeding and then the timer automatically turns it back on again. There's another one that I uh, I actually turn on, and uh, that helps blow the power or blow the food around, keep it from settling. Yep. And uh, that one will turn off uh, after three quarters of an hour, but then it it's also set to come on on its own at various times um, through the day and through the night, but. Uh, um, while all these will uh, have their, you know, the programming is just basically on the timer, I, I physically do it at feeding time and turn one off and turn the other one on. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, I, I absolutely do too. Nicole, I, I, I don't want to call on you and set you out, but I don't want to leave you out either. Um, when you're, when you knew that your fry, and if, when you knew that your fry were getting ready to be born or when you saw them doing the egg exchange, did you have to adjust flow at all or? I actually had no idea he was pregnant. And oh, that's right. The egg. I, I didn't see them do the egg exchange. That's I actually, right. I have two pairs and I have two of them are the mini erectus from Dan and then two are the regular size erectus from Alyssa. Um, I did come home from work and I knew my, my big female had dropped her eggs two days before while I was at home. So I knew mm. it wasn't them. So I, I assumed that, you know, there was nothing, you know what I mean? Cause I saw eggs, like I said, yeah. when I came home from work on the bottom of the tank, but clearly some were transferred. Yep. So I was totally caught by surprise cause he was kind of small and he, he only had 16 fry. Yep. So he so, only got no, a couple. I, yeah. Yeah, and I was honestly, I was just watching my tank because that's what I do. <laughs> Next yeah. Time, and I saw a baby seahorse. I thought, I thought, I didn't know what it was. I was like, "What is that? It looks <laughs> like a seahorse." <laughs> a tiny <And> one. <laughs> jumped up and freaked out. Unplugged everything immediately and just waited. You gotcha. And had the rest of them the next day. He had two that night and had the rest of the next day. But, gotcha. Yeah. I no no preparation whatsoever. I had never even hatched a single shrimp. <laughs> No, I get like three hatcheries running, and it's crazy. And the, and I did want to ask before we move on: Are they still all doing? Have you had any losses or? No. Oh yeah, I've I, so I had sixteen. I'm down to eleven now. There are a few I know that are yeah. definitely not going to make. It's this is not easy. No, it's not. But and I and I think I told you last week. I won't go on and on. But the first batch, I don't ever even count on. To be really honest, the first right. batch from a pair. And you're doing such an excellent, so much better than I ever did. I'll just tell you that. I got, I got 11, left, 11 left at 12 days, and I'm doing the best I can. That's no. Well, and I'm doing daily 100% water changes. I have two sponge filters, like, in diagonal corners. So it's kind of it's kind of causing, like, a, you know, so most of the debris kind of goes to the middle. So I'm e it's easy to, si you know, siphon off mm -hmm. when I need to. But, yeah, it's it's not easy. No, it's not easy. Some are floating, some are sinking, and then they change their mind, and then they do the opposite. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. man. If you have anything you want to ask of the group, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you you certainly can. And um, one question for you, though. Um, if <clears throat> when you said you saw, the, you saw the one fry, and you were like, oh, my gosh, and you unplugged everything. Did you leave yeah. everything unplugged till the next day? No. Oh, no. No, I, no, I, just... I couldn't. You're right. <laughs> 
Because he didn't look like he was in labor, and then I was reading, and I asked questions, and obviously I was freaking out, and that's when Susan actually helped me a lot, because I, I said, what's going on? You know, I knew that there were warning cry, and I knew, all right, now I got to freak out and prepare to have more, and she said, usually, you know, 24 hours to 36 hours later, yep. they'll have the rest of them, because he was kind of acting normal, you know what I mean? He was eating, yep. so... I just kind of waited it out, and then the next day, the next morning, five minutes before I had to leave for work, of course, he started giving breath. So I woke my sixteen-year-old daughter up and made she her was a trooper, and she pulled she pulled them all out and got them in the tank for me. <laughs> well, yeah, that was oh. gonna be my next question before we move to fry maintenance, and we'll do fry maintenance quickly because we've already been going an hour, guys. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, you're you're just doing an excellent job, and the fact that you have so many still alive is, is to, I commend you and I, I want to tell you and Cheryl will back me up on this get ready because once they start they don't <laughs> stop <laughs> you're gonna have a new batch in a month watch I'm watching Bill. them like a hawk Billy. I, I like almost feel like a creep I'm always looking at them like come on are you doing this again <laughs> right <laughs> next time you know Kelly one of my first seahorse tanks that I ever set up and I'm going back over 15 years ago when seahorses like low flow. Yes. It was filtered with a Blueville FX5. It was a 59 gallon, pumped out 900 GPH. And I was running power heads in there also. This is before I knew that they were supposed to like low flow. Right. So you already knew the truth <laughs> from the start. <laughs> hey, they were happy. Um, for anyone, this can go to anyone, and then we'll kind of go around really quickly and say how, how you do a fry tank differently. Nicole already shared a little bit of hers, um, but um, one of the biggest problems that I had is that my tanks weren't drilled, and I was interested in breeding, and so, you know, I, I adjusted things and et cetera, but covering the, so my tank was not drilled, so I had to use an overflow box to get to the sump. And, you know, I wanted a sump for sure, and everything worked well, and then, of course, the return. But the overflow box, the, the babies would end up in the dang sump, and that happened to me quite a few times when, like, Nicole, I, I just didn't even know or wasn't ready or whatever. And then even when I did know, if I had to go to work or something, you know, so I, I did end up figuring it out, and I'll, I'll give you guys my spiel at the, at the very end because I just wanted this to be about you guys, um, but... If you don't have a drilled tank, what are you supposed to do about the overflow box? Anyone? <laughs> it probably probably knows, and she's probably not able to say anything. Is your overflow box overflowing? No. No, like, what? I'm talking about the box that you hang on the side of the tank. It has little slots in it, right, so that the water goes down into the box it goes over a hinge it's kind of like a mini sump on the side of the tank then it goes down the tube into the sump because my tank right. is not drilled so what i'm saying is the fry would go right down the little holes <laughs> and end up in the sump which was not a good situation in my sump because it didn't have baffles and there was a skimmer and etc just you know you don't want fry shooting down into the sump anyway so i just wondered i ended up coming up with this uh, material that Dan advised me on, and I ended up when I knew he was getting ready to have the babies, I would have to attach this material to cover the slots where the, it was just smaller slits so the fry wouldn't end up in there and the water would still flow. But it definitely affected water flow in general, and I'd have to reduce the return to, because it wasn't going down as fast. It was a pain in the butt. So I just wondered if anybody else ha has had fry in a tank that had to use an overflow box and if what they did i have some with overflow boxes and to be honest with you they are something that i have to stay up check out carefully every day to make sure i don't run into problems with them gotcha. whether it be air in the youtube or what else whereas my drilled tanks turn them on forget them no problems and i've been slowly phasing out all the non-drilled tanks for that reason no, absolutely. The drilled tanks are certainly the best. But like even in my SCA, um, even it, it's drilled and it still has the little notches where fry would fly down it because, of course, the fry always go to the top. So go ahead, Marina. Um, yeah, that's something I'm really super worried about. Um, I've been lucky in that I've been there when my seahorses have had the fry. And I turn off um, 
Yeah. I just turn off the return for a bit and the water drains into the sump. And um, then they sort of can't be sort of right. taken with the current. But I'm, I'm really worried that I'm not going to be home, home one day and they're going to have the fry and they're just going to get sucked into the sump and... Well, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean. Yeah, you, they, if they go through the pump, you know, I'm not, you don't want to find bits. That would be terrible. I'm sorry if that was gross, guys. But yeah, um, in my tank, the tank that I'm actually discussing, the the overflow box led to actually, literally, the algae scrubber. So it broke my stinking heart. And I came home one day and I literally found many still alive. Many lived, but many did not because they were literally on the scrubber <laughs> I mean in it was it was terrible I won't go into details because it was just awful but so I just wondered if any uh, you know uh, Marina I'll get with you on the side or maybe post in the comments afterwards because I got to look up the exact material that Dan told me to use but I have a little homemade thing that I slip over the 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 um, slots in the overflow box that you know has worked it, it definitely has worked but um, it's a pain in the butt so I just wondered if anybody had figured anything else out because Cheryl like I was saying even on maybe I'm not I'm, I only have one drilled tank for the record and it's the SCA but even on the SCA it has slots in the you know back where it's where the you know where it's a tap where it's drilled excuse me I'm stumbling over my words tonight um, so how do you stop the fry from going down turn the pump off with the timer absolutely but what if you're not home and you don't know when he's gonna have them well uh... Once, once you've been doing it a few times, you probably are going to have a pretty good idea. Um, and once I saw warning babies from the one day, then I knew the next day I was going to have them. So I set the timer uh, usually for about three hours before the light comes on because that's when they were going to give birth, uh, always before the lights come on. And uh, so I set the timer so that if I wasn't here at the moment, like if especially in all the years when I was still working and uh, not retired, then uh, I'd have to go off to work. But the timer would uh, turn things off mm -hmm. and uh, it would be a minimal amount. And I was in a position with my own business so that uh, I could slip home noon hour type of thing and uh, collect them and throw them into another tank just uh, until I got home from work at night. And uh, it worked out okay. Gotcha. Um, Go ahead. But uh, when I retired, uh, I never, I didn't keep uh, raising fry for much longer once I retired because my wife was dying of cancer at the time and I was spending more time with her then. But uh, it was still the same thing. I'd use the timer because I didn't know, first of all, uh, if I was going to be available to go down and turn it off at any given time. Um, but uh, sure, no. memory yeah. was the goal then too. So uh, <laughs> uh, I said it just in case. And it was just an automatic thing. If Fry were coming uh, and I was expecting it, you know, there was the odd time where they didn't come when I expected. So I said it again the next day. Gotcha. And, uh, it did work. There was the odd time we got a few out of the sock, but uh, it was never all that many. And you can, folks, uh, just to let you know, as I was telling my scrubber story and he just mentioned the socks, you know, if you find them there, see if they're moving because I've saved some in that situation that literally flew down the return or down the overflow box and to the sump onto a scrubber with water pouring over them, not engulfing them that lived. So I must have gotten home really quickly or something, but always check. Hey, Jim the Reefer, I just saw your comment and you're a perfect person to ask because um, is there anything that's been invented for this? Is there a new product for someone that needs to block off the flow for fry? I mean, even maybe if it's reef, you know, in a reef situation with clownfish, I'm just trying to figure out how they, you know, what they use to block it off because I've had to use this material and it slows down the flow and then I have to adjust everything, big pain in the butt. Um, so let me know if you have any thoughts or if anyone in the, in, that watches this later, send us a comment on what you've done, how you've done it, or what you've used that's worked to make sure that you don't lose your fry just because it's 
you know, because you're not there. Um, and I wanted to, uh, the two questions I have left, guys, because we're running a little late, the two questions that I wanted everybody to have a chance to answer is how their temperature they keep their seahorse tanks at, and if there's any difference between how you keep your regular tank and your fry tank, like as far as water changes, as far as Nicole kind of covered a little bit of it, you know, do you use different equipment, um, and et cetera. So we'll do it really quick. And I want to read Holly's because poor Holly has to sit there and just <laughs> participate in comments. Um, she did say she tests everything once a month, nitrates once a week. Interesting. You do use live rock, but no corals. Um, and she tries to keep her tank of about 70 degrees, but due to summer, if she can keep it under 80, she won't panic. Right. Uh, good point. We're going to talk. I'm going to ask everybody else about temperature, but I'm, I used to, be a stickler on temperature and Dan kind of finally explained to me and Cheryl and everybody else finally explained to me that it's more about not having spikes one way or the other it's not as important you want to keep it beneath a certain temperature which I'll let Cheryl and everybody talk about but um, it's not it's more important to make sure it's not jumping up and down constantly a little swing isn't gonna kill anybody but yeah and then she said she also has all of her fry, uh, 10 left, No, none have died since day 7, and today is day 12. That's for you, Holly. And that I think that was all she said so far. So, all right, let's go to Cheryl really quick. Why is temperature important, and what do you keep your temperature at in seahorse tanks? Wait, repeat that. I just I stepped out for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what temperature... Do you keep your seahorse tanks, the adults, at, and why is it important? Uh, maximum of 72, and that's in the summer. Uh, they typically run about 68 in the winter, and it's specifically designed to reduce the proliferation of pathogenic bacteria because as temperature increases, the volume of pathogens will increase dramatically. So keep it under 72 or 74, some say, to avoid bacteria, bad bacteria. Yeah. 74 is a max. I tend, to, I tend to start to panic when they get up to 72 mm -hmm. because I know how fast they can heat up in the South Texas heat. Ooh. And I haven't so many tanks, I can't run chillers. And what I do is I have uh, what are called turbo blower fans Mm. And I have them sitting in front of the sumps and blowing across the surface of the sumps. And they do a really nice job of dropping them about four to five degrees. That's a really good idea. I, I, I've always heard about fans over the tank, but putting it on the sump kind of makes more sense. It's kind of, yeah, it really kind of makes sense. And uh, do you um, worry about swings or uh, just keeping it below a certain, because you've talked about a swing. You're talking about 68 to 72. It's only four degrees, but... Um, do you worry like if it, if you notice that it's going up and down throughout the day or are you just main, mainly trying to keep it low to avoid bad bacteria? Well, I keep the air conditioning set at the same temperature. So the house stays at the same temperature. Gotcha. And typically with the pumps, it'll increase over the house temp about three degrees. And with the turbo fans, they will keep them at or below 72. They really don't change much. The only time I have to worry is in the fall when we get hot days and cold days, sure. and I have to pay attention then. But other than that, it's not a big deal. They really don't fluctuate. Well, again, though, I'm not, when you've got a tank, my smallest system has over 60 gallons of water. So it's really not going to fluctuate that much if there's only a degree or two difference change in the ambient environment. Sure. If I was running a 30 gallon with a canister filter, I'd have a lot more problems. Yeah, bigger tank, you don't have to worry as much. It's going to stay, it takes longer for it to change. Ray, I know you'll probably have to go soon because you, um, you know, I'm running it late tonight. So I, I definitely want to hear Marina's answer from Australia and Nicole and Holly. But uh, Ray, what temperature do you keep your tanks and how do you accomplish it? Um, I have central air mm -hmm. and, uh, it, uh, uh, set for 21, uh, which is about, uh, 69, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 
that's it's set for that in the daytime, but in this hot weather, it gets up higher because uh, it runs full tilt and I can't handle it all. But uh, I want it, the, the tanks themselves, I want them under 74. And the ab tank, I want it under 68. Um, the barb tank has a heater in it and it's protected. It's because uh, at midnight, I, the uh, air conditioning goes to 15, which is 59 degrees. Oh. And it'll stay there until 1230 the next day. You like it cold in your house, don't you? <laughs> I have to have it cold for sleeping. Oh. But then I get up in the morning and I walk 7.7 .7 kilometers on the treadmill. And I have to have it cold for that, too. And uh, so at 1230, it goes back to uh, the 6970 uh, level again. But the tanks... They'll get down, uh, this uh, barb tank, it will get down uh, around 62, 63 um, at the lowest point. But it's too much of a swing to go from uh, in the daytime to be sitting uh, in the 72 to 74 range and then drop down so much like that at nighttime all the time. So it cover heater. So the heater uh, keeps it from going below 68. And then I know yeah. you, you've you actually shown us um, on Wine Wednesday, but for the abs, you mentioned that they're at a much lower temperature and to keep them at a lower temperature, just very briefly, you don't have to go into detail. They can go watch the old video, darn it. I'll try to link it in the description, but he has, you know, covered with, what was it, tarp? What did you cover your... It's just, it's industrial plastic that... Um... I don't know whether they still do it because they see this Tyvek stuff all over the place now. But in the old days, uh, you put the insulation up and then you covered it with this heavy industrial plastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have that hanging around, uh, made a room out of it. And then uh, off Kijiji, I bought a used uh, air conditioner. And uh, so I have it. Uh, not sitting in a window, it's sitting in the house or in the basement part itself, but it's directing the cold air into the uh, partitioned off area to keep uh, that 90 gallon tank and the 40 gallon sump it has to keep the uh, temperature down in that. And it'll put off heat into uh, the main part of the basement, but then that's going to be uh, taken care of by uh, the central air. Yep. No, I, I, I loved when you, you went through that, and, and, and it just shows how important temperature does become to seahorse keepers, that, you know, he's willing to give his seahorse tanks based on their species needs, uh, you know, literally heat and air at times that it's not going to match his house, so really cool. Um, this is cheaper than uh, using chillers, and especially, like, over the years, I've had, uh, like, as many as, I guess, eight seahorse tanks at a time. Not counting the fly setup, and uh, to buy a chiller for all these setups, uh, it would be a, a ridiculous amount. And, and especially what, here, in the where prices are uh, twice what uh, they are in the U.S. Right, and and we'll talk. We'll save the conversation about why you don't combine tanks for another day because I want to get to um, really quick. Or did anybody, Cheryl? Were you trying to say something? I just think uh, Ray's tends to be a lot colder than uh, we get here most of the time. I do not even keep any heaters at all for my tanks. Right, right. If you're able to yeah. do it with central air, that's fine. But he explained that he has to have it cold at night and when he's working out. So I, I totally understood what he meant by heater in the barb tank, air conditioner for the abdominalis. And I just think it's cool that he goes out of his way to make sure that they're at stable temperatures. Um, and Marina, I'm really curious about you because you're in Australia. Um, have you have you had to what what temperature do you keep your tanks at? And do you do you use a chiller? How do you do it? Or has it just worked out differently for you? Um, so I try to keep it around 22 degrees, which is I'm about to pull um, out my phone. One <laughs> and a half in Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, so it does just, it does swing about a degree either way. 
And how do you accomplish that? Um, I'm quite lucky in that the house stays a pretty stable temperature. Yeah. Um, so I have heaters to stop it getting too cold, but I don't run a chiller. Gotcha. That's interesting. In Australia, you've got heaters to stop it from being too cold. Uh, you must have some excellent central air. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, really quick. Or did, were you going to say anything else? I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Just, um, yeah, it's just in a, um, a bigger sized room that the reef tank is also in. And I don't know if just so much water being in the room also helps keep the room mm. sort of a more stable temperature. But um, I've never had to use um, a chiller in, in summer. Well, that's awesome. That's so good to know. In, in, the in, the, in the rooms that I have multiple tanks, I always have, but this, for the record, this is probably based on my old home and, you know, just my particular home, but I always have a problem with the humidity in the air and all that, that crap. So it makes it sticky and warm and yucky. But uh, anyways, uh, glad it doesn't happen for you. Okay, I heard the echoing. Sorry, guys. Okay, Nicole, real quick. Temperature, you keep your tanks and how you accomplish it. It's usually about 72 right now. And we've had like almost 100 degree weather for the last couple of weeks. Um, but we keep our AC on 70 during the day and then we turn it down to 67 or 68 at night. So that's worked out so far so good. <laughs> Absolutely. And I want to, um, Holly, I think you already told us in the comments, but feel free and I'll relay it. Um, and final question, guys. And then, and of course, anything you want to talk about. But, um, Nicole, you, you kind of, you basically explain the differences in your fry tank. You don't, you know, you explain the, the uh, sponge filters and, you know, et cetera. But how often do you do water changes? I know you've told us before, but for anybody who didn't see. Every day, 100%. I've been doing it. And do you, and, and how do you do a hundred percent water change? Uh, so right now they're so small that I'm sucking them out with a turkey basin very gently and just kind of putting them in my big measuring cup <laughs> temporarily then draining, suctioning out the bottom, then scrubbing like basically the tops, the sides, the bottoms. And I'm just submerging the, um, sponge filter in old, no, the two sponge filters, should I say in the two. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in a bowl of old tank water and then kind of just giving them a good squeeze before I put them in the new mm -hmm. tank water. And then I also just got like some biomedia in a bag that I put in the bottom to just kind of help, hopefully, and added some biros, biospira to see if it will help a little bit, at least keep the ammonia level down in case, like I said before, if I can't do a water change one day or yeah. it's late. I just don't want to see anything happen because of an ammonia spike. Absolutely. And you should never have an ammonia spike, you know, in one day, but with the feet, excessive feeding and, you know, like you said, if you have to go more than 24 hours, I'm right there with you. I think I told you last right. week, prime, <laughs> prime's great yeah. too. <laughs> and I only have, I only have a small amount of babies. I only have 11, which right. is, you know, and it was originally only 16. So I'm probably adding more brine shrimp than I need to, but I also want to make sure it's available in front of them when they need it. <laughs> Absolutely. Paranoia. Quick, no, quick tip though, because I, I'll tell you, seriously, uh, that my, the first probably six months that I was trying to raise fry, I did it exactly like you did. I was successful many times. So don't let anybody tell you you're doing it wrong. Um, Cause if it works, it works. Um, but I made that same mistake where I was overfeeding Brian Trent, making sure it was like full all the time, you know? Um, and I, I learned eventually that it, you can actually overfeed fry. And when they're eating so much brine shrimp that they're like, I literally had, I watched a fry uh, poo. And I don't know how to say it nicely, guys. Poo a live brine shrimp. And, and it came out and it was, it was live. And that means that they're not gaining any nutrition from it. So I'm not telling you what to do, but just a, you know, just a tip from somebody who's been there. Um, maybe, you know. No, Don't, I agree. Yeah. And also, since I started enriching them, because I ordered enrichment, but it was like after they were born. Yep. So I ordered enrichment from Alyssa 
but it took, you know, a few days. So I was making sure that the, you know, the baby brine shrimp that were in there still had their yolk sac. So I was giving them extra because I knew it wasn't enough nutrition. <laughs> no, you're um, not, so you're I, not wrong. I cut, yeah, I cut back a little bit, um, but I'm still kind of paranoid. And I also look at them and I say, oh my goodness, are they the right size that they should be at this point? Are they too small? I, do, I just don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I know, and you you want to do it right. I get it. And I the the size that they came out, I like I knew that they were small, but I was like, wow, I didn't know that they were that small when they were born. So I was shocked. And I can't see yours, but they are tiny. And as I said, just don't. I'm I have every every hope and every I believe that some of these guys will succeed. But if they don't, just constantly remember first first batch always kind of. It doesn't work out as well, and uh, you, you're going to get another chance, I promise, in a month. And and you'll hopefully have two sizes then because you'll have some of the old ones. <laughs> I hope so. You will. We'll see. I'm doing my best. I'm trying not to beat myself up when somebody mm -mm. when one of them drops. I'm like, oh. I know. But it was to be expected. It is, and I know your feelings. Believe Where me. What, Ray? Where do you start having six to 800 at a time? Right. And then she'll be like, won't even notice if any are missing. They can have quite a few babies. <laughs> I honestly feel like they were being kind to me by only having a few. <laughs> well, yeah, you didn't even expect it. And you managed to keep them alive. That's so, uh, yeah, that's really good. You've done a great job. Um, but uh, Ray, how do, you, how do you handle, how did you handle fry tanks? Water change schedule? Anything different? Any about different uh, ways that uh, I wouldn't be able to mention at all sure. on here. Sure. But I started off very simple, four liter uh, jars, which is a little bit more than a gallon, and I have a dozen of them. And uh, I do water changes every other day, 100%. And as I mentioned before, green water in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, guys, you can, uh, you can. Sorry to interrupt, but you can see this on Wine Wednesday, the fry uh, version. I can't remember the exact title, but it says fry in it. And Ray actually showed us these uh, containers. Go ahead, Ray. Sorry. So basically, uh, it was very simple. And it, I didn't succeed for a while. But uh, on my 10th attempt, I finally uh, got my first batches to grow up and sell. And then after that, uh, it was just... They started getting bigger, and of course, that meant bigger batches. I had a red eye that used to give out uh, about 1,100 at a time. Wow. That geez. was too much to handle. I was giving away to other people that wanted to try and raise them. What no. did you keep those in? Yeah, what was your, what, Yeah, Ray, what was your success? Well, when had, you finally got successful, well, what well, were you well, doing? Sorry, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, Kelly, I need to log well, off. I was Feed seahorses. Okay, no problem, Cheryl. You know what? We'll we'll make sure to have another fry session soon so that you can share your excellent fry expertise. Okay. Sorry we okay. took so long tonight. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. We won't go much longer, guys. We've gone a long time tonight. This has been a long one, but I just wanted to make you guys are I'm not even gonna cover what I do <laughs> because I'll tell you another week, guys, because this has been great. What, we don't Ray? want to get into all the different ways I've done. We don't want to get into, <clears throat> excuse me, all the ways that I've done because it takes so much time. Right, no, just tell us your most but, successful. Uh, what was the most successful? <clears throat> well, I, I was only, uh, like in those batches of 1,100, uh, I'd probably only end up with six or 700 uh, that would get to the four months where I would start selling them. Um, and I wouldn't keep every, like they were producing just continually. So, and I had no way to keep uh, doing batches. So I would do a batch uh, when they're that size and then I wouldn't uh, take any more for two or three months. I just let the fry go because mm -hmm. uh, it was just too much to handle. And especially here in Canada, trying to find uh, places to sell them all is very difficult. Our population density is nowhere near what it is in the U.S. And that sounds tough, maybe, to someone that's new to it. But uh, when you get 
to doing it properly and get successful, it, it really, you're like, where am I going to put these new babies? <laughs> oh my gosh. There's, hun you know, so many. But Ray, I mean, I, all I was trying to get from you, and then I'll, I'll quit asking you so many questions, was when you know, the most successful method that you used when the fry were just coming at you like crazy, you were only keeping every couple batches because you didn't have room, but you were past the jar stage. Were you mainly doing like 100% water changes on, on the tank, or what did you do? To no. uh, um, I went with sumps that had live rock in them mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> drilled 55 gallon breeder tanks that the fry would be in. And uh, um, I used, uh, I guess, over the intakes just to make sure uh, they didn't get sucked down. I didn't have very high flow going to the sump, mm -hmm. but uh, I still used filter, but it was material much like the uh, the socks, mm -hmm. only not quite that tight. And uh, uh, I know some people were using uh, women's uh, Panty nylons, yeah. pantyhose and that, sure. and cut that up and use over it. But I had this other stuff available to me, the stuff that my wife had, and uh, I don't even remember what she used it for now, but sure. she had enough of it that uh, I'd cut a piece off when uh, once it started deteriorating and, and each tank, had, I, the stuff would probably last three, four months at a time sure. on each tank. And uh, uh, when she died, I still had the uh, material left over, so she had so damn much of it. Wow. Well, lucky you. You should have sold whatever you had left if you didn't use it all. But no, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna definitely discuss this much further in for future weeks. You know about the fry, about how to you know we're gonna get some comments. I'll maybe do a post to ask others that couldn't join us tonight or don't watch it later um, what they do, and we'll get some actual answers or ideas in here. But Marina, what's been your uh, method for fry, and what's worked best for you, and what's different? I've only actually tried to raise one bunch of fry myself mm -hmm. and I'm getting ready for, um, I've got two pregnant males at the moment, so I'm getting ready for those. So I really don't have much experience, but um, I'm very, very nervous. The first lot that I tried to raise, um, the fry only made it two weeks. Mm. Don't beat yourself up. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. I'm just, yeah, very worried about giving it a go again. Well, don't be, because it's not just you learning. It's I, I truly believe it's the seahorses, too. When they have their first batch, you know, they're learning. They may have done something wrong in the development phases or in the egg-making phases or whatever, you know. Probably not, but maybe and young, a younger male is, you know, I'm just saying don't, and then with you, you know, you'll do better the next time. I did the same thing. I only had one live out of my first batch and it was pure luck. And that's why I named her Cheryl because she was just a fighter. She was going to live no matter what I did. Um, but most of the time that just doesn't happen. So definitely don't be afraid to jump back on that horse. <laughs> See <your> horse. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I'm not very funny. Anyways. Um, and yeah, like I, I, I've told so many people that ask, you know, talk about fry and we will again, maybe uh, next week or in a future week, um, but we'll do a more focused on fry thing. But yeah, definitely learn about feeding them, make sure you know how to do a hatchery and how to raise the, and then, you know, get them to four weeks and then we're on to, you know, weaning them onto foods and then that's, that's a whole different story. Just get them to four weeks and then we'll go from there. Because the rearing uh, after the um, nursery is is a whole different thing. But you guys can do it. And once they're at four weeks, you get them weaned on frozen. And, and I just think that becomes so much easier. Would you agree, Ray, that once you get them weaned on frozen, it's kind of cake? Well, see, in my experience, I'm the point it. where you could do it was batch like it wasn't a consistent thing and i don't think i in all the years i was doing it, i don't even think uh i had any converted over in four weeks time mm. it was probably four weeks before it started 
that's what I meant. I'm sorry. Starting at four cool. weeks, up to six, seven, whatever weeks. It, I just meant like I never knew at the beginning well, when I first. There were probably two months old. What? what? Yeah, they'd probably be two months old on the average, uh, and some of them would be almost three months old. Uh, each batch, uh, like you would, the same parents could produce fry that one batch. Uh, you could get them switched over in two months and the next batch might be three months. Uh, every batch was different. Sure. I, all I was indicating is that, um, you know, one of the mistakes that I made early on is not starting to try when they hit four to six weeks. Um, I just, I, at first I wasn't even trying until they were like three months old. And, and as you said, sometimes that's what it becomes. I just meant starting to try it for get them to four weeks and then we'll go from there. <laughs> They shouldn't be weaned mm -hmm. at that point. That that's anyways. Sorry. Um, okay. I were you gonna say something, Marina? Um, I had a quick question. Yes, if that's okay. Of course. Um, I've seen a lot of videos and people's pictures of fry where the fry is sitting at the top of the water, even if it's just for a little while, like not floating, but I guess they swim up to the light. Yes. Or whatever. Um, and then I've also heard that they can never touch the top of the water and they'll they'll sneak air and if they sneak air they'll die um, that's not that's what's your sort of idea of that I wish Dan was here right now he I, for the, by the way I never mentioned this from the very beginning but he had to have some, some he had a he had a bad day so I knew he wasn't gonna be able to make it tonight but he is one of the people that's been doing this for 105 years just kidding Dan I, I saw Mermaid 3, if you liked my seahorse pun, you were the only one. Nobody else laughed, but it's okay. All right, anyways, back to the point. Um, he is the one that educated me on this, and that's why I'm, I probably won't say it perfectly, but he actually did an experiment, and Ray, you can correct me if I'm saying it wrong, but he did an experiment back in the day to prove that snick the air theory wrong, and he put something, I can't remember the details, he put something over the top of the water to make sure they didn't actually hit the top of the water. And he still had the same problems that were associated with hitting the top of the water. And he, and that's why they used to use the, um, the, the round, uh, the Chrysal, I think it was called. I could I'm probably saying it wrong. I was sure I was still here. Um, but they used to think they had to keep them spinning round and round and round to never touch the surface and etc. And yeah, that's just been it. And he'll tell us more in detail next week. I'll make sure to ask that question. But the snicking air at the top is not true. I've never worried or done anything about it. And I can't tell you his exact experiment that proved it. But when he explained it to me, I just never worried about it. I turn everything off when my fries born. I want them at the top so they're easy to collect. So I turn off power heads and everything. My tank's literally not running uh, once I see fry. And then I collect them in whatever way with siphon or with a cup and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, don't worry about them hitting the top. That was a really long explanation, but did that. I know. I, I, I can't. I, he'll give you better details. <laughs> well, thank you. No, yeah. Um, Everybody has a lot. different dollar. For me, uh, uh, I can honestly say that uh, almost exclusively for about the first month, I didn't allow the fry to go where they wanted. Mm. I had enough money uh, um, to keep them moving around. Now, mind you, the, the food density was sufficient so that they were just snicking as uh, uh, they were being... Uh, uh, forced around by the water flow and as the food goes by they'd snack so it didn't bother them and never cut out and never made it hard for them to feed uh, they still lived mm -hmm. uh, but it was just it worked for me and I kept on doing it so uh, it's not a case of you have to uh, have low enough flow so that uh, they can uh, gather at the top it's just I started uh, like Dan did back in 2002, and uh, that was the recommendation at the time to keep them in motion all the time. Sure. And, uh, I just carried on, and uh, until they got, uh, I'm. It was it would vary from batch to batch. When when they got to a certain size, then I backed off on the flow and then let them uh, do what they wanted. 
Sure. And I actually, uh, to be honest, uh, Marina, I know you got one more question, but to be honest, if Cheryl were still here, we're definitely going to talk Fry in, in a couple, you know, in the next week or two. Um, if no other topic is, you know, needed really badly, but Cheryl would tell you and Dan would too about the tubs and everybody can't set up a tub with a, a standpipe in the middle um, and some underneath. Everybody can't do that in their homes. I ended up trying and I'm going to say again, everybody can't do that in their homes. <laughs> but if you're really interested in breeding beyond past uh, just the hobby phase, then that really is one of the best methods because of the fact that you can bring returns up and we'll bring pictures and talk about this in detail in a few weeks, but you can bring returns up, two of them that hook on the side of the tank. If you've ever seen Alyssa's post, she does it the same method. Um, and you can point them at angles in, in both directions that keeps the spin this way instead of this way. Um, but it, you know, it does kind of keep them off the surface, but it's more about what Ray was talking about, keeping them moving, keeping the food circulating and moving. Um, and it, honestly, they lower it during feeding, lower the return rate that's keeping them spinning, um, between when they're feeding because of the fact that they don't want the foods to go down the, you know, or, or clog up. Okay, I'm, I'm not even going to go any further. I'm going to say we're going to talk about it another day when they are actually here because they can say it more eloquently. But all I was trying to say basically is the bottom line that uh, it's not necessary to keep them off of the top. But you can, for sure. And we'll talk more. <laughs> okay, Marina, what were you going to say? At, what was your next question? Um, just thank you. That's really helpful. Oh. Um, the, last, <laughs> the last time sort of... um. Before I came, it was like, oh, I was just in such a, a panic trying to, like, catch them without letting them touch the top. And then oh, no. and yeah. trying to get the flow right in a way that they didn't stay at the top. And I felt like it was too much flow for that, like, to keep them off the top. I just thought it was too much flow. And then they were being bashed around and it was just a bit of a disaster. Well, this is, I just made the decision right now, literally, unless someone says, I really need this topic covered next week, we're going to go to fry again, but specify, you know, how to, basically, I'll come up with a really great one-liner, but I don't have it yet, but we're going to talk fry next week, and I'll make sure that Dan and Cheryl are here to answer more extensively, but yeah, absolutely, I turn everything off, the fryer at the top. Uh, I don't know if they're snicking air or not, but they're, they're all fine. So, but we'll get more details on that. And Ray, um, final question for you, even, uh, even though you've explained, you did a different method and you did keep them spinning and Cheryl and Dan will talk about why they keep them spinning. But when, when they actually were born, you didn't worry that they would touch the top, right? No. And, uh, um, Listening to Nicole a while ago, there she was how she was getting them out to change the water. Uh, I actually used a small brine shrimp neck, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I lifted the fry out, and I just lifted them out and into the other water, just in and out fast. I didn't uh, worry about uh, somebody was Beat uh, touching air back then. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I don't lift them out uh, so they're and back into the, the new water fast. So I don't think it's a, a big thing. You don't have to scoop them out and keep them in water. Right, right. And, and Nicole's method actually did make sure they never breathe air, which is fine too, you know, um, totally. Um, right. In fact, that's another thing I know Dan will talk about next week is how he actually has, if there's hydroids and stuff in his main tank, he actually puts them through a process of cleansing before he puts them into their nursery. So we'll, we'll let, I won't try to speak for him or Cheryl. We'll let them educate us next week. Uh, and I can maybe talk more about me because I know y'all's missing me rambling on and on, right? <laughs> All right. I know Mermaid's Reef wants to hear more of my puns. All right. We, when we go this long, you guys, it starts getting echoey and staticky. So I'm going to call it for tonight. Unless some, Nicole, did you have a question that I didn't allow you to ask? Just one really quick question. Absolutely. Regarding the fry tank and the light cycle. 
Yes. I, and I know there's different, different opinions. Some people say they leave their lights off at night and some people say that they leave it on because let's let them grow stronger. Mm -hmm. But where mine is still only 12 days old, I'm kind of conflicted. For the first week, I left them off. For the second week, I'm leaving them on. I just, I'm curious, like, do I let them rest at night or am I supposed to be That's, leaving the lights on? That I, I literally just made a mental note and I'm going to write it down. And that'll be the first question because Dan and Cheryl will answer that fabulously. I'll give you my answer in a, minute, in a sec. But Ray, what's your answer? You can do either way. I always, when I had them in these jars and I had green water there, they were lit 24 seven because I wanted the green water to grow. Um, and it, you know, they still lived and uh, everything went fine. They grew. And uh, then later on when uh, I got into more sophisticated systems, uh, then uh, they were uh, dark at night, light in the daytime and worked fine that way too. Yep, uh, I was just gonna say my answer is when I switched from um, an actual, fr when I had the fry tank set up that you're you're currently using, um, I did I used literally a lamp uh, <laughs> over the tank and I turned it on when I got up and turned it off when I went to bed, uh, but I made sure it was on when they're eating. When I switched over to the fry tubs, I don't even have lighting on the tank at all. They are, have the lighting of the room and that's it. So I, Thank you. yeah, I would agree. Don't worry too much about it either way. Um, maybe, maybe I would say probably make sure they have some sort of light when they're, when they're expected to eat. Um, and I know you think, I know they need to eat constantly, but they do sleep too. I, do they sleep, Ray? I think they sleep. They must sleep. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, mine sleep, mine sleep when the lights are off. <laughs> what, Ray? When I was talking about 20 having lighting that was just ambient light right i didn't uh, put a light directly over the jars most times I, there, my, uh, my there was often a lamp on light there but uh, it wasn't specifically to shine a light on there it was to uh, shine a light on the brine shrimp uh, containers that were down below the the fry my hatchery is close enough you know what I mean? My brine shrimp hatchery is close enough that they'll get some ambient lighting anyway. So I'll probably just shut them off. Soon. Yeah. And thank I, you guys so much. And I'll, 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 I'll actually ask Lucy. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you guys. I'll actually ask Lucy too, because she has um, thoughts about lighting that are more specific because she definitely uses it as part of the feeding process. It's because she has a bigger tank and she wants to fry to congregate where the food is. So I'll ask her, and she has uh, internet issues, but I can at least get her comments before next week. Um, so we're, we're talking fry next week, y'all, so come back. <laughs> but okay, I'm gonna call it for the night. Everybody say bye, and I'll see you next week. Night all. Bye. Bye. <laughs> all the lovely ladies, and I'm so loud. Okay, good night, everybody. Holly, hopefully we'll figure out the mic, and we'll See everybody next week. Happy Wine Wednesday. Cheers.